urban building blocks to create public space. But we are yet to appreciate how we do this with towers. And for myself, going back 40 years, uh, as I was studying housing in North America, and public housing was built, being built everywhere, and then levy towns were sprouting everywhere, it seemed to me then at the time that the problem was to create a new typology of apartments which are houses with gardens, and perhaps uh, diffuse the pressure for suburbia, because after all, in an urban setting, you create houses with gardens and streets in the air, all prefabricated economically, et cetera, et cetera. But I, I came to realize, of course, that it's going to take more than just a building type, but really a fundamental change to urban transportation and to urban structure uh, to, uh, uh, to, to deal with this uh, rising pressure. I want to briefly show you a city that we've been working on for a decade, uh, the city of Modi'in in Israel, halfway between Tel Aviv and Jerusalem, which is being built on virgin land. And I'm doing so because there is one principle in the planning of this town that I think is fundamental to my sense of urbanism. Uh, and that is that cities always have spines of life. And when you create the spine of life in the city, <coughs> Uh, you get the kind of meeting place and interaction that brings the different people of the city uh, towards each other. This is the plan of the uh, uh, Byzantine Jerusalem. It's a famous Malaba plan which shows like every Roman city, a Cardinal Maximus, a central street, from gate to gate, the spine, all the temples or churches or whatever are plugging into this major spine of the city. And we were observing that most of the new towns built in the 30s and 40s in Europe uh, Chandigarh, for example, Brasilia, were based on the concept of a superblock with little neighborhood centers in the heart of each neighborhood. The concept of transportation divided from the concept of urban activity, and these became deadly places because, in fact, no neighborhood is autonomous in the city. The neighborhoods in the city are part of the fabric of the spine of life. And so the diagram that we created was to try and have a linear center which in fact, uh, combines both transportation and the activities of the city. And so this city that's made with the topography of valleys running east-west uh, becomes, each of these valleys become the spine of the community, schools, parks, neighborhood facilities, and urban structure defining the edges. And where several valleys converge, we have the, uh, uh, the town center, and so on and so forth. I won't go into the details. But it's this linearity, this concentration of uh, activity, uh, mixed use, and handy traffic at the same time is how the plan of the city evolved. Each valley with its own species of trees, each valley with its own identity. These pictures, by the way, are Beverly Hills, not from Israel, which are the principal. <laughs> but as you can see, our trees are growing as well. I want to take one public building uh, to talk about, again, this business of interaction, of public activity. It's the Salt Lake Library, which opened about two years ago. And again, the objectives are interesting. Uh, interesting. The city declared it wants to create a library which will reverse the trend of downtown being an abandoned place and start bringing life into the downtown area. The site of the new library right next to City Hall, in a city that does not have a rich urban life, uh, after office hours. And uh, as the objective was stated, we started thinking through what are the ingredients that will make a library more than just a library. And this was one of the first diagrams that said, they asked for a piazza. How do you make this piazza, outdoor piazza work? Uh, and what are the ingredients? Well, we talked about cinema, shops, cafes, auditoria, other activity. We talked about the roof overlooking the wonderful mountains around becoming a reading garden, and so on and so forth. So we also said a successful meeting place must work in all seasons, winter and summer, in this case going from desert to very cold winter, uh, daytime and nighttime. In Singapore, the cycle of day to night is very strong because you move to the outdoors at night and you, and you do not uh, do so during the day. And so we started talking about an urban room, which is air-conditioned and heated space, 
that flows, and so that light can actually cycle in and out uh, within the building. And then the public could also climb up the crescent wall from the outside to the park on top. And then someone said, can you give us a precedent on how people climb up on walls like that? <laughs> Um, there's a great uh, lens window, we call it, facing the mountains, and it faces south. Uh, and the question is, can you get real transparency and openness, even though it's facing the sun at that time? And I'll come back to that in a moment. But we enter the urban room uh, from the city, and this urban room is open uh, almost 24 hours a day. It is a place of much activity, the, 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 uh, the uh, library spaces, crossover, there are reading galleries, uh, and you see the urban room with parties, receptions, lectures, dinners, not to mention all the activity, and it's already changed Salt Lake completely. And it's this mix of uses, it's the focusing of public life. Here you see that lens uh, facing the mountains. At, at winter, the sun comes in, uh, this heat is trapped and brought into the building. At uh, summer, the sun is shaded and exhausted, and a double glass lens wall permits you to both reject or accept the energy depending on the season. The children's library, as you see, is below, and they create their own little environment by pulling up uh, the shades and so on and so forth. But what's interesting to me, looking back within two years, this has really changed the downtown. And they have festivals, and they have fairs, and we've made it into Archie's. Uh, you can see here, <laughs> this is a world famous Salt Lake Public Library. It's awesome and double wow, no, a triple wow for me. <laughs> and as one TV station during the opening uh, was interviewing young people coming to the library, a young kid about 13 came in and said, what do you think of this library? He said, with a library like that, who needs them all? <laughs> Um, I, I mentioned the fact that uh, the RFP talked about an iconic building on the promontory. And I have to confess to you that this led to very intense discussions within our team. Uh, uh, the Marina Bay Sands team, the architectural team, uh, uh, because, you know, what is the iconic building? How do you achieve an iconic building? Is there a connection between uh, the expression of an architectural icon and its content. This was lots of discussions about that. Uh, because, in my opinion, uh, an iconic building has meaning. Uh, and the meaning has to do with its content. A church is a church, a courthouse is a courthouse, a concert hall, these are all very different buildings. They have different meanings, different expressions. And also, uh, an icon has to do with place, because it has to do with culture. Uh, you don't, I, I don't see an icon, iconic building evolving in Jerusalem that's the same as a building that I might evolve in Los Angeles. And so uh, I want to just touch on a few projects of ours which have to deal with this question. And the first is the National Gallery of Canada, which sits across from Parliament uh, on the other side of the river, the Museum of Civilization, uh, National Gallery of Canada, and by definition, National Gallery, as, uh, in fact, as uh, uh, Prime Minister Trudeau said at the time, we're the only capital in the world, he meant in Canada, that has the arts on the skyline in equal prominence to uh, the state, uh, to governance, and to the church. Uh, but to just uh, touch on the concept again, this is Schinkel's famous museum uh, of uh, 1890, that is so typical of most galleries of the 19th century. The public space is in the heart, and the galleries for art surround the building. It's a building that basically turns its back to the city. And we reversed the diagram. We said the galleries are the heart of the building. The public spaces wrap the building. And so the, the public activities in the building become part of the experience of the city every day. And so with Parliament here, the cathedral here, the gallery became the trip, the, the uh, part of the uh, freeway relationship. And again, to me, it had something to do with place. And Ottawa is a neo Gothic uh, place. That's the Library of Parliament. And right across from it, 
in a kind of a conversation is a contemporary building, it's glass, it's transparent, but it is having a dialogue with a with the parliament across. And uh, as expected, this became the place where almost all events of state occur, all, all heads of state, etc., etc., are received here. It's a building that transforms with the sun, it's shaded, it opens up uh, when, when at it, winter, and so on and so forth. I, I, I chose another project which is currently under construction, which is Crystal Bridges, a museum of American art and cultural center uh, in Arkansas. Uh, it is being built by Alice Walton, the heirs of Walmart, uh, uh, Sam Walmart of, of uh, Walton, 